Okay, well, let's not belabor things. We are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Precious Miller, and I am the coordinator of My Best Building Economic Stability today with Michigan Center for Student Success. We are recording uh, today's webinar um, and conversation today. I am believing that this is going to be a helpful dialogue and conversation that is going to be shared far and wide after um, we connect today. I do value everyone's time and I understand that sometimes life just goes and goes and goes and we don't get a minute um, to just take a beat, take a breath. Um, and so I kind of just want to give us a moment to do that wherever you are, if you are standing or sitting, I just welcome you to do one thing, big or small, to differentiate yourself from everything that happened uh, this morning to what is happening right now. For me, that's turning a page in my notebook. Um, for some of you, that could be relaxing your jaw or lowering your shoulders. It could be taking a drink of water. Um, just try to do one thing to differentiate yourself from what's happened already in the day to the moment that we're in right now. So I'm stealing a moment for us to just be present as we talk about sense of belonging in the era of COVID. Um, this is a long, uh, in some ways, the pandemic just feels like it just keeps going with no end date. And so I find value in just stealing moments back and saying, I am in control of my time and what I choose to do with it and the intentions that I bring with the time that I share with others. So thank you all for joining me in that moment today. So we are going to begin. I always start every single webinar with my amazing colleagues because I believe that it is important to give honor where honor is due. And I honor my colleagues, Jenny Shanker and Erica Oriens. Thank you, Erica, for being here today. We make up the dynamic team of Michigan Center for Student Success. And I would love for everyone to have the opportunity to um, welcome and introduce uh, yourself as well. It is a fairly small group, but if you feel comfortable, um, more comfortable placing things in the chat, that is okay. If you wanna unmute, that is also okay. This is our meeting today. And so we get to set the standard of what this meeting is going to look like. I am gonna be depending on all of you to um, share your contributions and your ideas. And I believe this is a great way for us to begin. So you can go ahead and unmute or in the chat, just go ahead and share your name, the institution that you are with or representing and your role at the institution. I can go ahead and break the ice. Hello, my name is Precious Miller. I work with Michigan Center for Student Success and I am the My Best Coordinator. What's one word that would describe how you know when you belong? Oh yes, that's another great question. Um, so after you uh, share your introduction, go ahead and share what one, what one word would describe how you know when you belong. We are talking about sense of belonging today. And so I'm curious to know how it is that you know when you belong. Perhaps there are things that exist and our personal experiences of belonging that we can bring ties to when we talk about the student's sense of belonging. My name is Lorraine and I'm from Henry Ford College. I'm the manager of academic advising and student success. And I guess the word that I, comes to my mind is community. I'll go next. I'm Patty Davignon. Don't mind my hat today. I'm running in and out of the house, so it's chilly. <laughs> Um, I'm from Muskegon Community College, and I'm the Director of Student Success, and I would say the one word for me would be smile. My name is Amanda Semricks. I'm from Alpena Community College, and I'm the Director of our Strengthening Institutions Program grant, and um, my word would probably be synergy because I just started working with another department and things were just flowing and everything was working well. Um, and smile works too, because it made me really happy. <laughs> Love it. Um, hi, I'm Megan Vineyard uh, from Macomb Community College and I work with our student options for a success program. Um, and Amanda, I, I'm piggybacking off yours a little bit because I was thinking collaboration 
when I feel like I belong, it feels like everybody's kind of um, able to work with each other. I'm Kristen Carey Lee. I'm a project manager in institutional effectiveness at Oakland Community College. And I would say um, when I feel heard and understood. Hello, my name is Sherry Malay and I'm from Henry Ford College. I'm a student success navigator in the advising department. And I think body language is a good start. And I wanna go back to the person who mentioned a smile. Um, we see each other physically first, so sometimes your mannerisms, um, um, smiles, etc., can be the first start of allowing or making somebody feel um, welcome and belong and a sense of belonging. Hi, everybody. My name is Heidi Romero. I'm from Muskegon Community College. I'm the Career Services and Transfer Manager at the institution, but also a member of our care team helping um, in the Student Success Department. Um, and I would say um, that body language, I think somebody had already mentioned that, but I mean, first impressions can give so much. And I would say definitely body language um, and attitude would be a, a really big word right from the beginning. Uh, I can go next. Uh, my name is Samer. I'm from Henry Ford College. Uh, I'm a student success navigator advisor there. I would say, I, I, someone might have said it, but I would say communication. Um, you know, when you're communicating, you're, you know, you're more involved with what, whatever's going on in the department or the school. So I feel like communication is a big, is a key thing to um, feel belonged. Thank you, Samer. And I apologize for mispronouncing your name. Thank you for that correction. Oh, no, no worries. It happens all the time. <laughs> um, my name is Rachel Henderson. Um, I'm the new success coach at West Shore Community College in Mason County. Um, and I work in the admissions department. I would say I would describe belonging when, when you feel accountable to someone else. You have um, you, someone's depending on you to do something. Um, and so you have to, you know, do your part to be in that community. I'll go next. Hi everyone, I'm Nicole ford Kondracic from Henry Ford College. I'm the Assistant Director of Enrollment Services. And I would say my word is connection. You just, you feel that connection and you know you belong. Hi, I'll jump in. Uh, this is Amy Gothi. I am the Director of Student Wellness and Equity at Mid-Michigan College. Uh, keeping my camera off because this is a lunch and learn today. <laughs> so um, uh, the word, everyone has used like great words and stole the word that I thought I would use next, but um, or borrowed it, I guess I would say. Um, I think support is a good word to use too. Um, I feel like I know when I, I belong, when I have support of those around me and that they have my back. Uh, Amy, this is Erica Bolig at Grand Rapids Community College. Um, I was actually going to say exactly the same thing. Everybody has had great words. The only additional one would be support. So I think the tweak on that um, would be support, but also challenge. So um, you're supported, but also challenged to grow, um, as well as um, building off the communication point that came up earlier. Um, if they can't support you or think open and transparent um, uh, with that communication as well. I'll go next. Um, my name is Ashley Cheers and I'm an academic advisor at Henry Ford College. And the word I would use would be calm. Um, I know when I feel calm, I know I belong. My name is Katie Sellers. I'm the Director of Mentoring and Advising at Mid-Michigan College. I feel I belong when I feel supported and a member of the community.
Did we miss anyone <clears throat> that would like to share? Erica, you got one, Orians? Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Erica Orians with uh, Michigan Community College Association. And um, I think, I mean, yeah, like everybody said, you all have great words, um, but I agree. I think the communication piece is so important um, that, you know, I get an agenda and I know why I'm here and, and what we're focused on. So I always appreciate, I always feel belong. I feel like I belong when I know what's going on. Okay. And I, my one word is just to be, when I feel like I can just be, be myself, be my authentic self. That is when I know um, that I belong. I am very appreciative to all of the words that you all shared today. And you um, didn't know this, but the word that you shared is the thing that you are gonna be able to contribute to today's conversation. So thank you all for um, bringing the sense of belonging to this group, because it is going to take our sense of belonging here to talk about and identify specific strategies that we can use both as an institution facing and as individuals to support students and knowing that they matter. Okay, so there are two perspectives to consider in our conversations today. Um, most of what this is, is conversational. And as we share ideas back and forth, ideas that currently exist, ideas that are in development, um, there are going to be perspectives that the institution can do, things that the institution can begin practicing so that students feel that they matter, students feel like they are connected, that they belong, that they are a part of a larger group. And then there's gonna be that individual perspective. So things that I can personally do in my sphere of influence in my day-to-day -day interactions with students and with colleagues. So just keep that in mind as we have our conversations today. I'd like to begin with a shared definition of belonging, and it reads, students perceived social support on campus, a feeling or sensation of connectedness, the experience of mattering or feeling cared about, accepted, respected, valued by, and important to the group or others on campus. And this definition is from Terrell Strayhorn. He has done a lot of research and work and has lots of um, books and publications around the idea of sense of belonging and sense of belonging being that secret sauce to those, our favorite words, retention and um, enrollment, all the things that keep our colleges going. And I believe that everyone who is at the, in this conversation today understands the value behind the sense of belonging. And so even tying it back to the words that we would use to describe sense of belonging, all of these things, connectedness, a feeling or sensation of connectedness, those aren't things we can necessarily measure. Uh, I can't necessarily measure um, an attitude or transparency or calm, but these are feelings that people experience. And so these are topics that we're gonna be sharing um, when we have our discussion portion. The way that our time together is structured is we're going to view a video from Terrell Strayhorn. And there's two clips. The first clip is five minutes. The second clip is six minutes, lunch and learn type of style. After we view the video, we're gonna discuss it. I do have some questions to prompt our discussion and I'm gonna be typing fearlessly away on my end to capture all of your thoughts and really give you all an opportunity to cross share and collaborate on institutional and individual ways that we can support students in feeling valued and important to the campus. So our first video again is by uh, Str Terrell Strayhorn. It is um, a YouTube video that we're gonna be viewing. I will provide the link. It is also in the slide deck that will be shared after. The title of the video was How Sense of Belonging Creates Competitive Advantage and Why Schools and Businesses Should Care. So he does a great talk, um, but we are just gonna be jumping in when he's talking about um, the practices of sense of belonging and the aspects to mattering. So I am navigating away from the PowerPoint and opening up uh, YouTube to play the first clip. And can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear it? And that's exciting because what we know from research is this, that mattering has four elements. I'll highlight them 
give you a quick example and then we move on to our final segment. Mattering um, is composed of or comprised of attention, dependence, ego extension, and importance. And by that I mean people feel like they matter when they have your attention or they feel like they, they can command someone's attention. One way that we um, command people's attention or let people know that we, they have our attention is by looking at them, by um, speaking to them, by seeing them, by knowing their name. I just heard a colleague of mine the other day who made an observation I thought um, about after our call. He was saying that um, he was on a Zoom call and it was a meeting much like this where everyone had their cameras off and he turned his camera on for the presenter because he said, I didn't want to be rude. And I thought, hmm, I didn't know it was rude to have your camera off. And it's not. But if you think about it, um, one thing that we were wired to see each other. And when we can see each other, we know, wow, I've got their attention. They're looking at me. They're nodding. I can tell you, I love speaking. I love speaking about these matters, but it's really hard to do this virtually where I can't get the call and response from the audience. Um, so there's something about attention that really helps us not only connect to one another, but it fosters belonging. It's also that belonging is related to dependence. Others look to you for advice. They need you. They value your contribution. You want to, you know, have a huge uptick in your staff retention or your students retention, create an environment where individuals feel like you need them. This college can't go on without me. This organization wouldn't exist without me. These faculty can't teach this class if I don't show up in class to help them teach. Um, and I, you know, I've had an example like that. I tell the story all the time about a school I went to speak at um, a couple years ago where apparently a chemistry instructor on the first day of class when reviewing his syl syllabus told his students, you know, look, I've trained X number of years to teach you chemistry. I've got all these publications on chemistry. Here's the plan for the semester, what we're gonna do week one through 15. And then he said, but guess what? You can throw it in the trash can if you're not here because I cannot do it without you. None of it means anything without you. You are the secret ingredient that makes this class work. Well, talk about a shot in the arm for students to feel like, wow, I play a role in this classroom. I matter, that's dependence. Ego extension is always about um, self in another. And it's the idea that people feel like they matter when they feel like others are just as proud of their success and will sympathize with their failures. Um, I think this happens a lot in strong educational settings where students want to learn from faculty and connect with administrators who are almost just as excited about them graduating um, as they are, who are just as frustrated that they didn't pass the quiz as they are, but applied to business is also true. People love working at places where their personal successes become shared with the group, the organization, that moving a project from start to finish is not just a solitary act, but other people, their teammates, their supervisors, maybe even corporate leaders, will celebrate their successes with them. And that when they um, don't close the deal or struggle, that other people are just as vested in that experience um, as they are. And then lastly, people feel like they matter when they feel like they uh, play important roles. And that's simply about being the object of another person's concern. So I think all of this shows us a lot of... Okay. I know it was so good. Hang on, we'll get to that part next. <laughs> We're gonna start by talking about uh, mattering and how we can support students in understanding and, and feeling like they matter. So I'm gonna swag, segue back to the PowerPoint and I am gonna be taking notes um, as you guys have some um, candid dialogue and have some conversation around this. Um, there are some questions that I'll place in the chat to kind of get your mind going of, okay, where do I start? Um, what's something that I can share? Um, let me get that here. 
So I've put the place, the questions in the chat that you can begin to reflect on. I'm curious to know um, what some strategies are um, that you've been thinking about regarding helping students um, recognize that they, that, that they are recognized and that they're seen. Um, everything that is shared is valued. And I want, um, I'm hoping that everyone feels comfortable sharing their thought, their idea, their suggestion, something that's happening at their institution, because it may spark another idea in someone else. Okay, having said that, the second um, question that Go you ahead. to answer, um, <laughs> uh, how can we communicate to students that we need them? How can we celebrate students? And how can we share our care and concern for students? Okay, I'm done. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and start. I don't want, I, it's so simple, right? I mean, um, our team and there's, I see I have a few colleagues with me today here. Um, our team works with students who have been placed on an early, early alert by faculty. Um, we we uh, text them and um, let them know that we care. And we say those words out, you know, we type those words in the text. We want you to be successful. Um, please reach out. I wanna know that you have uh, resolved this with your instructor. Um, let me know that you've done this. And I have seen messages uh, from the team um, to students when they respond saying, congratulations, I'm so proud that you took that step. Um, yay for you. Look at you. You're making progress. You're doing great work. Um, that's all. That's all. And I, we need to do more of that. I, uh, I agree. Like, out, outreach is huge for students. Um, because when you're not reaching out, like we try to, we, when we have like our slow times, which we'll try to like reach out to our certain students and our that we that are in our programs that we work with, like I'm in health careers, for example. So we'll reach out and just kind of check in, and it shows it, it comes a long way. Like Lorraine said, it's kind of simple, but it comes a long way. And when students see that you're reaching out and checking in on them, it's a huge it's a huge success. They'll they'll feel comfortable with you as an advisor. And they'll keep coming back to you for even if they change their program, they're still going to come back to you for advice and help. I mean, I have multiple students that do that on a regular basis. So um, it's, I think that's the biggest thing I can think of off the top of my head that really works with us. Mm -hmm. So email, texting, something like that, phone call. I think the work the colleges, all of you have done to update your websites and be more clear with communicating with students about program requirements and sort of reducing the frustration of searching for information online. Um, I know that is really tedious work, um, but I was just doing some research at other colleges that you have to contact them now to get information about the program. And, you know, it just, it, it feels, um, it wasn't at community colleges, it was at universities. Um, but, you know, I think that, communicating to students, you know, that this is that the college exists. I think what Terrell said, like, couldn't exist without them. Like this is, th these resources are, resources are for them to use. I think that really sends a powerful message and differentiates community colleges. Um, one thing that I think that we can always do to show students that we care and that they we recognize them is um, using inclusive language. We recently, after a hiatus at Macomb, we started up um, a training that's open to all faculty, staff, and students um, that is all around different issues pertaining to LGBTQ communities and just how we can be more inclusive and be more mindful. And when you complete the training, you get a little Sign that you can hang up in your office that says that you've done this, so that this is a, a safe place that students can expect respect and to be communicated with the way that they would like to be communicated with. So I think something different things like that are really helpful, just making sure that the campus community is um, responsive to students' preferences.
along the same lines, I have appreciated seeing the variety of pictures on the website that reflect the students that are um, looking to enroll or are enrolled. I think having that um, diversity in pictures uh, can speak a lot about um, who's welcome. And so I've appreciated seeing that expansion. Precious, you know one of, sorry, I know I'm kind of over contributing today, but um, the, one of my, uh, one thing that I find to be very not inclusive is bad signage on campus. Um, Precious knows that it is one of my pet peeves, but um, you know, many, especially now, we have a lot of students who've never really been to campus or explored a big part of campus. And being an outsider who visits a lot of campuses, um, clear, I, I just think that, that, that those kinds of basic um, practices really make people feel more included. I think piggybacking off what you just said, Erica, um, here at MID, we did some work around being trauma informed and thinking about some of our space, knowing that we can't just knock down walls necessarily, but how do we create that welcoming environment in places where uh, personal information could be needed to be shared in um, kind of a, a setting where there are other people around. And so we wanted students to know that we understood that that could be uncomfortable. And if they wanted to have that conversation in private, that they could let us know and that we would figure out a way to like pull them out of that public space. Um, so I think like trauma informed signage is, is um, you know, really helpful when you can't necessarily move spaces around. One thing that was on my heart today, this morning, as I was driving into work and taking note of gas prices along the way, uh, anticipating uh, student needs, um, I think that this price, these price increases are going to have a huge impact on students' ability to get to campus and to get to class. And what is the institution willing to do or is able to do to ease that burden? Um, how are faculty going to accommodate students who literally don't have money to put in the gas tank to get to class? Um, even some of our colleagues may be impacted by this as well. So um, just anticipating student needs. I think something else is asking students what, how we're doing and at making them understand that we want to change and improve and we want their feedback. And I think um, students appreciate being asked, well, how was the service? And we have to be okay with the good, the bad, the ugly uh, and accept that and, and make changes. But that's, you know, in student service and I think in the classroom too, all too often we wait till the end of the semester and students can do an evaluation. But you know, a midpoint check-in from an instructor is huge. How am I doing? Can I change things? How's the pace for you? Um, it helps students feel valued. I agree with um, Nicole's point of asking students. Um, I just worked with the Student Success Center here at ACC and we did a focus group for students um, two weeks ago now, and it was really beneficial. And all of the students said, you know, thank you for asking us. Like this shows us that you care and that, you know, you'll make changes or work to make changes. I mean, there was some negatives and some positives that were shared, but overall they just loved that they were asked to share. So I think um, actually the Dean of Students planned another one. I'm not as involved with it, but it's on another topic because the student said, if you ever want to know anything else, like let us know, we'd like to do this again. So I think that was a really positive experience. I have something that might be considered kind of minor, but I know that when I've done this in the past, it made a big difference is recognizing students' birthdays um, mm -hmm. and just saying, oh, happy birthday if it's your day or if they just recently had a birthday or if they've got one coming up. I think it kind of makes it makes the rapport become a little more personal. And I, this probably pig piggybacks on maybe celebrating the students, something like that. Um, 
but I've had really good feedback when I when I did that in the past. So. Sherry, I love that. I, in fact, I uh, have been working with a student pretty consistently for a while who has really been going through some some stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, um, he kept talking to me in, in our phone conversations about his birthday coming up and how he was feeling old at 32. And, um, <laughs> and I, uh, I actually sent him a birthday card to his home. Oh, um, and he has mentioned that three or four times in the last few times that we talked. So it, it, it's huge. I think those small touches, we can sometimes underestimate the impact of them. I had someone just call me up randomly and said, I was just thinking about you and it just touched me. You know, something so small to someone else was really big for me. So any and all suggestions that you guys pose are valued and welcomed. Um, so thanks for sharing. And I, um, Samer, were you going to share? Samir, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to pretty much, I was going to add something to like, you know, showing empathy to the students in a way of like, when they come to you, you know, maybe they have an issue with something with like a class, like they, like they really want to be heard. I think the main thing with a lot of students is like, whatever they're telling you, you're, you're trying to help them out. You're really showing it. Cause I've had students where their only experiences with with an advisor and a teacher. That's their only experience with any employee at Henry Ford. And if they had a bad experience with a teacher and they told me like, you know, my only experience is with you and you, you're, you see my compassion and stuff like that. I, I, and like the teacher being however they were doing, whatever was going on, kind of pushed them away. So like, you gotta have to bring them back. So all employees, if they show like, you know, that the student is like, we can hear it, we're listening, and we're really going to try to fix whatever or work, or work it out or if they can, right? Something like that. Like, they want to be more involved in a way like that. So I think it's a big thing. It kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier in the beginning of all this, when we were talking about communication, like, you know, re communicating to your student, if they email you, emailing them a week later or five days, you know what I mean? If you email them, the faster you do it, the, the better connection you're going to have with that student, and they're going to be more wanting to come here and and try to stick it out or whatever's going on. So there's stuff like that. I think communication is huge. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. There's a question in the chat. <clears throat> Do any schools regularly send out surveys or host focus groups for students each semester for their evaluation of a certain service or experience? This was the first focus group we did in a probably five years. Big time, Amanda, great. Um, any reactions to that question <clears throat> or those questions? I can add a little bit to that. Um, so we've, especially over COVID, but we've done this even prior to that, we've really focused on doing like a check-in survey with our students, but especially during COVID, just to check in with them and see how they're doing and is there anything that they need. Um, but then additionally, the other part of that is, is there a regular assessment of other services in the area? So in our strategic enrollment management plan that we have, um, that's actually one of our objectives to one of our goals is to have an assessment for each of our service areas. So there's some of them have them. So for example, you know, I, I'm in charge of the early alert portion, you know, our care, our care team, we have an automated email that goes to students when we close out their case, right? From an early alert standpoint. But our registration area, the Welcome Center doesn't necessarily have a service assessment for students to be able to provide their feedback. So that's something that we just recently, yesterday, had a conversation on. How can we get to that where we're continuously asking for their feedback? And it doesn't necessarily have to be in a survey format. Um, it can be something that's right there at their fingertips so that we're not saying, hey, we need you to do this right now. We're saying this is available for you to tell us feedback all the time. So that's something that we're focusing on. Um, we have a goal to get that completed like by the end of this fiscal year, I think this academic year. Um, any other 
suggestions, recommendations, things that are working. Okay, you guys are fabulous. Um, let's segue over to see what else Terrell has to share with us. Those are play, ways in which belonging connects to both education and that. But other people, their teammates, their supervisors, maybe even corporate leaders, will celebrate their successes with them. And that when they um, don't close the deal or struggle, that other people are just as vested object of another person's concern. So I think all of this shows us a lot of importance roles, uh, play, ways in which belonging connects to both education and business, applied to practice. And I'm going to, I made these general so that you can apply them to your particular domain. You want to foster belonging in business or in education. What you're trying to do is create a high touch environment that's marked by safety, security, and consistent communication. And it's not just that we say that a place is safe. When leaders um, formulate and adopt policies that um, ban or prohibit discrimination, that um, deal with appropriately how to handle harassment, verbal and physical. What you're doing is not just good leadership work and it's not just good policy development, you're actually doing the work of belonging because you're creating and adopting and implementing policies that will provide safety and security for your team and your students and or your students. You're also looking for um, personalized interactions, especially with leaders and supervisors or faculty. Quality shared time, something I did years ago, but I never really thought about it until it was sort of reflected back at me through my own work is um, I used to run a center and I would, you know, sort of have my brain um, storming sessions over lunch. It's a way to sort of get two things done at once, still work and get big ideas on the table, but eat because you have to eat. Remember Maslow's hierarchy, food is important. And so I would invite people to lunch and we would enjoy lunch and enjoy each other. Um, and we would brainstorm these big ideas. What's our next strategic move? What's the next piece of our strategic plan? But one of the things I learned was I would often call on like sort of my, my team, my direct reports to go to lunch with me. Maybe my strategic thought partners, um, which is a smaller nucleus of people. And then what I learned is that those who are not part of that um, strategic thought group felt left out because, you know, that people would come back and say, oh my gosh, we had a great time at lunch and he's so funny or he's not so funny. I don't know what they said, but whatever it was, um, it created this yearning for the other team members to have that same experience. And so I think I offer that not only um, as my own sort of personal sharing, but to remind us that quality shared time is important for everyone, no matter where they are in the organizational chart. And especially if you're the leader, if you, the higher you are in the organizational chart, the more responsibility you have to give some of that shared time to distribute it equitably to people. Um, sense of belonging practice is also about relevant, timely, accurate information about performance expectations or evaluations or what I'm calling tailor, tailored motivators. So if you're a leader who says, yep, yep, I do that. I write all my team a note that says, you're doing a great job, keep up the good work. And I copy paste it and send it to everybody. Um, or I send it on some mass lift. That is not what I'm talking about. Tailored motivators are, they don't have to be long. They don't even have to be emails. They don't have to be text. They don't have to be Slack messages, but they can be all of these things that really just nudge the individual to know, hey, I'm looking at you. I see you. Good job. It doesn't have to be that they closed the deal or that they got the Dean's list. It can be smaller um, achievements, but no matter what, it signals to the person, wow, someone cares about me and they're thinking about me. Um, all of the pieces I talked about earlier. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to highlight these and then wrap up. So um, you're also talking about in sense of belonging, um, immediate growth-minded feedback, growth-minded 
If you haven't read it, I celebrate the work of Carol Dweck. Um, book mindset, very lovely. You can get through it very um, expeditiously. She has a pretty profound but simple thesis, and that is that success tracks on to growth mindedness. This idea that I don't have to be perfect. Um, we're all works in progress, but I can get better with effort and practice, and that works in education or in business. And so when we give people feedback that gives them a second, third, fourth, fifth chance, um, gives them, celebrates their strengths, but also tells them what the opportunity windows are, we are doing the work of belonging um, because it creates this environment that's high touch, feedback driven, data driven, people care about me and I can succeed. For people to feel a sense of belonging, both in education and business, they have to be validated and to feel recognized. And so validation and recognition that individuals matter and contribute to the group's goal is important. And really it's the onus is on increasingly on those of us who are leaders to do so because we see connections. We see how what the person in marketing does and how it's influencing finances and how that connects to what the board wants. And so our job is to communicate that vision, but it's also to celebrate and to recognize. So I applaud businesses and institutions that create reward structures that celebrate micro achievements, that's daily, weekly, monthly achievements of students and staff, as well as larger goals. And then last and finally, that we create environments that collect and listen, use data on staff and student experiences, creating decision-making loops for leaders. So we often collect a lot of data, but then we don't always use that data um, when making decisions but we should be collecting data regularly on what are students' experiences, what are staff experiences. We have the created environments where people feel comfortable sharing with us this information, and then we use it in our practice. I'm gonna stop there so we can entertain some questions. Okay. I am curious to know what thoughts came up as we were listening to the second half of Terrell speak. You guys can go ahead and unmute and share um, as ideas come to you. We talked about this a little bit earlier on how we can create safe spaces for students, not necessarily tearing a wall down, but creating some sense of privacy, if that's like a, a divider or some sort to help students feel safe. Are there any other ideas on how we can help students feel safe? I also have some guiding questions in the chat to help our dialogue. I would say being reliable and making sure that that you do what you say you're going to do when you say you're going to do it. Um, that creates trust. We, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, I was kind of piggyback off of what I said. Yeah, I mean, if a student can trust you, they're going to feel more comfortable talking to you about whatever. And then you can, you know, they'll, if, because if they, if they feel like they can't trust a teacher or advisor or whoever, they're really not going to feel really comfortable or safe enough to like really speak their mind. And that's just going to hold them back as a student and growing as a person. So I think that's, that is huge to, to show that your support for them and they're and, and you're trust trustworthy and reliable on situations at least even if it's something you can't 100 help them with at least somewhere you can kind of guide them where to go and kind of give them direction so i think that's that's key um for for students i think it's also really helpful to help them reframe their narrative sometimes um, helping them understand like this is their point of view and like I'll have students say well I'm just going to mid or I'm just going to community college and helping them understand no you're going to college um, 
this is a challenge. Uh, it's difficult for a lot of people. So just helping them kind of change that language they're using with themselves too and look at things from a different perspective. This is Kristen at OCC. We're, um, we're really trying to build a data structure that gives us more real-time student information, things like are they attending class, how are their grades. Um, it's going to take time, but something we've been looking at alongside that is sort of intrusive advising or proactive advising that I've read can not only be when a student might be you know, showing warning signs, but also to celebrate them, right? So you can see a student who may be through that data was struggling and is now achieving, has reached a particular milestone in a program. Um, and I think just sort of customized communication, celebrating the student achievements or growth um, is one particular thing I'd love to, to see us do because I think that just, again, is personalized, um, you know, leverages technology plus a human um, and really makes, it's almost institutional empathy, right? Finding ways in your institution to build that that structure in, so. Nice, you're a wordsmith, institutional <laughs> empathy. <laughs> they said English dream, what are you gonna do with that? <laughs> <laughs> Change the world, that's what you're doing. Kristen, you reminded me, I added a link in the chat to um, some work that we did earlier this year um, around uh, guided self-placement which is the process of, um, you know, typically we gave students a, a high stakes placement test when they came into the institution and said, this is where, what you have to, the class you have to take. And the guided self-placement model really is more of an appreciative advising model where we are making, helping students make that decision. So they are placing themselves selves with guidance from the college. Um, and I think, uh, should we see widespread adoption of that? It's a it's a really transformative way of creating that sense of belonging, not only of the institution, but that I have helped to make the decision that I sh this is the math or English class that I should be in. I want to pose a different way of looking at sense of belonging in practice, and I'm wondering if you guys could help. What does sense of belong, when does sense of belonging start? When does it end? And what does it look like throughout the student experience? I think that that um, it's individual to each student. Mm -hmm. um, it takes time. It's about planting seeds with the student and communicating on a regular basis, uh, whether that's once a semester or um, once a month or whatever whatever is is um, seems reasonable to do. But um, once a student has that sense of belonging, it just needs to be continually cultivated and, and monitored, I think. Um, I think what it looks like as it, as it grows and, and becomes part of who the student is, that it, that it manifests itself in self-advocacy and ability to uh, um, advocate for themselves with faculty, with people they're not normally comfortable talking with. Um, and then just growth and progression through the through the process and that they show us that they're in charge of their their goals and their dreams and their future. But we've planted those seeds to help them have that that um, foundation to build on. That was real good, Lorraine. Mm -hmm. I agree with you 100%. Just FYI. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'll, I'll make a note of that on your performance evaluation, Sherry. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, good one. Well, I think Lorraine, you make a really good point because particularly with technology today, you really, I mean, sales, you know, salespeople personalize that communication in many ways. I mean, there's so many options to personalize that. And Terrell talks about sense, he talks about sense of belonging from multiple vantage points in his book. One thing that he does talk about is um, belonging uncertainty and that um, some students may not know that they belong. And so they are routinely looking for signs and signals to confirm or deny their belonging and mattering at the institution. Um, but I hear you, Lorraine, in that sense of belonging does take time and it's something that the students measure and have to communicate and, and advocate for. And it's easier for them to do when they have built that trust and that trust has been cultivated by the institution. So then sense of belonging is twofold. It, the institution has a role in that sense of belonging and so do the students. So for the sake of time, I love this dialogue. You guys have no idea how fired up I am about this. Um, let's talk about putting this into practice. So what's one takeaway, one thing, one strategy that you would like to bring to your leadership, to your team, or to your work um, that we could add to our slide here? What are some institutional practices you could put into place? It seems like communicating opportunities for involvement to students early on um, is, is a beneficial strategy to help them find that sense of belonging. So whether that be like work study opportunities, um, student life clubs, just different things that they can connect with to feel that um, sense of belonging to the campus community. Mm -hmm. I'm going to set up a, a basket here in the office that's full of note cards and envelopes. What are so you going to when, do with it? Well, I'm just going to be there for all for the team to to use at their leisure or their their um, inspiration. I think if a student's name pops in my head and I think about them, they're in my head for a reason. So I'm going to send them a card. That's beautiful. I think um, like institutionally, when we're talking about outreach and communicating to students the different opportunities, one piece of feedback that, um, that I've heard is that students who maybe have later start classes or have evening classes are sometimes feeling a little bit left out. We do have a welcome week. We do have on-campus activities and they're usually right at the beginning of the semester and during the day. Um, so they're, are a lot of students who maybe don't feel all that connected to the campus because they don't start right away in the beginning of the semester. They have 12 week or eight week classes or again, yeah, the evening classes. So maybe trying to do some extra outreach um, for those students. That's a really good one. I like um, that idea, Megan. We also have a welcome back bash, but it's really only for the students on campus. And we have a lot of students um, online now. So I think that thinking of something to include them would be awesome. And then another idea I saw that I'm gonna to bring to our committee is um, exit surveys after advising. At ACC, our faculty are the advisors. And in the focus group, we had some positive comments, but some negative ones, you know, some people just really work well as an advisor and some don't. And I think that having an exit survey would help us um, better streamline that process. Any others? Well, this was a great start. Um, I 
am so thrilled. You guys came up with so many strategies and different ways to think about this. And as you think about this before you go to sleep tonight, because everyone's going to be thinking about sense of belonging before they go to bed, I'm sure additional ideas are going to come to mind. And again, you'll have this PowerPoint to refer back to, to have some additional aha moments. Um, quickly, I know we have three minutes left and I'm trying to maximize our time here. I just want to let everyone know about things that are cooking up with um, Michigan Center for Student Success. If you haven't yet followed us online, you definitely should. And this is your cue to find us on LinkedIn and Twitter. We are currently um, engaged in conversations about leveling up. Um, our efforts and commitment to equity, both in our uh, personal lives and our professional lives. And so it's we are having some really great dialogue. We're going to hear from a few community college presidents next week about their take on um, equity and higher education. We have some additional webinars coming up for those of you on the call who are project leads. We're going to be meeting on March 22nd. Those of you who are interested in um, amping up your communication streams, the FAFSA data for targeted student outreach may be a webinar that is of interest to you. We are inviting um, our financial aid and all of those in student services, but every person who is looking to strengthen their communication streams to students and using FAFSA data to do that, this webinar is for you. We also have a My Best webinar with NCII, and we're going to be talking about the student life cycle and how the student life cycle interacts with um, the economic stability practices that we have been focused on over the last couple of years with My Best. And finally, but not least, if you have never had an online party, this is your chance to join us. We have our My Best Milestone Celebration scheduled for June 7th of 2022 from 1 to 2.30 p.m. These events are not yet listed on our website as we just solidified these like 24 hours ago. So you guys are getting the hot new events that are coming up, hot off the press. The Krispy Kreme light, donut light is on. We um, just hope that you can mark your calendars to join us for our online celebration. Uh, the PowerPoint will be shared out after today's meeting for all who have registered. And I am just so thankful and appreciative of the time that you shared with us today and with your colleagues. And with that, I hope you have an amazing afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.